have your Bible, I want you to turn to Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 22. Once you've found it, stand so that I'll know that you're there. We're going to read together. You may have a different version of the Bible, but we should get greater understanding if you read your version while I read mine aloud. You read yours silently. Some Bibles are written for interpretation, uh, transliteration, uh, and paraphrase, so they all have their own purpose. Once you have found Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, please stand and we'll get started with the message for today. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. And if you're not searching, I need you to stand so that I'm not waiting on you. I'm waiting for people to find it, so help me out if you don't mind. going to go ahead and I know a couple of you are still searching by your seat. We're going to go ahead and read. And my Bible reads this way. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. But if thy, uh, thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. You may be seated as we tag this text with the topic, I, E-Y-E, can see the light. I, E-Y-E, can see the light. In today's text, Matthew is recalling um, the Sermon on the Mount, which starts in Matthew chapter 5. And so we're somewhere close to the middle when we look at Chapter 6, the sermon progresses from perfection to the condition of the heart that is in the art of perfection. Chapter 6 moves uh, explaining the heart with uh, concepts like alms to others, not being motivated by the glory given by men, uh, the concept of prayer not being something we do to be seen, the concept uh, or the method of prayer being a secret act where uh, God rewards you publicly when you do it. Uh, forgiveness as a response to what God does and will do. Um, the method of fasting as a private gesture to seek after God. And uh, our motivation in life should not only be about our lives, but about his life. And the land, and it lands, it lands a whole progression lands on where we are today, it lands on our eyes should be filled with light. Our motivation should be based on something bigger than self-gratification or self-ingrandizement. The motivation should be based on eternity in the things that we do. In a sense, Jesus explains that we all, that all, all we do should be based on the Father's heart, on the Father's will, and the Father's purpose. In my suffering, it should be based on the Father's heart, his will, and his purpose. In making peace with my fellow man, it's not based on the fellow man. It's based on the Father's heart, his will, and his purpose. In turning the other cheek, it's not based on you. It's based on the Father's heart, the Father's will, and the Father's purpose. When I go the extra mile for my fellow man, it is based on the Father's heart, the Father's will, and his purpose. In doing good to them that do me wrong, it's based on the Father's heart, the Father's will, and the Father's purpose. In giving to the poor, I'm giving to the poor because of the Father's heart, the Father's will, and the Father's purpose. When I pray, I'm not praying because of you or me. I'm praying because of the Father's heart, the Father's will, and the Father's purpose. In forgiving my fellow man. I am forgiving not because of you or because I think you know better. I'm forgiving because of the Father's heart, the Father's will, and the Father's purpose. In living this life, I'm living this life for the Father's heart, the Father's will, and his purpose. In a sense, 
focusing on the Father's heart, the Father's will, and the Father's purpose, but my life will keep light in my life. On last Friday morning around 4 a.m., many of us in the CSRA were awakened with a loud wind roaming and outside of our doors. It was as if God himself was knocking on our doors. About 5 a.m., we had lost light and we were sitting in darkness listening to, uh, listening, uh, to, to our, um, uh, our personal possessions being ripped apart. Uh, we, we heard the, the, the siding being ripped from our houses. We heard things being ripped out of the yard. We heard fences fall. We heard all kinds of things going on outside. And we found ourselves around 8 o'clock staring at somewhat of a calm, but it was the beginning of life-altering, a, a, a life-altering experience. We were living without natural power. We were living without light, and we were seeking ways to recover from devastation. When I had no light after four days, I had discovered a way to rest in where, what I had become. I mean, I had learned how to cook on the grill, boil with a propane tank. I would learned some things that I never thought I'd do. I learned, I learned, I learned that if I needed to wash clothes, I can wash it in cold water. And I don't even know now how to take a cold bath. I've learned some things that I did not know before the storm came. In a spiritual sense, we are all born in a world without power living in such a darkness that there is no light. The reality is our minds are conditioned for the darkness of the world rather than the light of God. We are all living our lives trying to do our own thing. We even sing songs as a clarion uh, uh, announcement of where we are mentally. It's our thing, do what we want to do. We do what we want to do because we are living in a dark, dark world. Because of the absence of light, we have learned to live in that darkness. We are comfortable with that darkness. We have adjusted to that darkness. Instead of trusting in the Lord, we trust in what has provided for us. Life is filled with worry. That's a sign that there's darkness. Jealousy over possession of others. That's a sign that there's darkness. Stressing over what might come. That is a sign of darkness consumed with amassing things for ourselves. That is a sign of darkness. Too busy to come and help our fellow man. That's a sign of darkness driven to only things that makes us look good. That's a sign of darkness. Always concerned about what others can do for you. That's a sign of darkness. Always concerned about what others say. That's a sign of darkness. I'll preach to myself. I don't need nobody else to say amen. Uh, uh, Constantly holding grudges. That's a sign of darkness. Many of us have been in darkness so long that we've adjusted to living in darkness. Darkness comes out of your vocabulary where you complain about everybody around. That that, that, that means you've been in some dark places. We can tell when somebody's dark because they're never happy. They're always complaining. They're always frustrated because they have not opened their eyes to the light of God. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says, but you, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, stop complaining, a holy nation, a peculiar people that sh- you should show forth the praises of God who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. He called you from that craziness. He called you from the complaints. He called you from the chaos so that you could let the light shine. I want to see the light. In order to see, there must be light. Without light, the eye can only focus on darkness. But to focus with light, you must first understand the process. Light emits photon particles. Photon particles bounce off of objects in all directions. And that light goes through the retina, and then the retina pigment epithelium makes pulses. These pulses are transmitted through the optic nerves uh, to the optic pathway, then to the brain. So now we perceive based on light bouncing all over the place. You, didn't, you, didn't, you don't feel that. 
When the light bounces, I can see things clearly. Life will have dark moments, and this proves that people around you are in darkness and they need light. People will make you feel unimportant. That means they need light. People will make you feel unworthy. That means they need light, but so do you. People will make you feel insignificant, and if you fall victim to that trap, you need light just like they need light. People will make you feel unqualified. When you walk in a room at night, the first thing you do is what I do. I, I just flip on the light. I, just, I can't help myself. If I walk in a room, even if it's a little dark, I just flip on. It's just natural. When you get to the door, you flip on the light. And I'm wondering if anybody here has a habit of going into a dark, dark world and flipping on the light. As soon as you hear somebody complaining, you got a testimony that will flip on the light. As soon as someone starts talking about somebody else, you got a testimony that flips on the light. If you're going to walk through life's rooms, you got to learn how to turn on some lights. I see the light. When I accept Jesus as my Savior, I will allow him to lord over my eye so that light not only fills me, but I myself become a light. I can see the light. And so my question I would oppose to let you get out of here, because some of you are playing with your, your iPads and floating all on Facebook and taking pictures of your shoes. My question is, how do I fill my eye with light so that I can become light to the world full of darkness? How do I fill my eye with light so that I can become light to the world filled with darkness? The first thing you got to do to fill your eye with light is give your mind to the light. Matthew 26, 22 says, the light of the body is the eye. The light of the body is the eye. What is the light of the body? The eye. The eye. Not the eyeball, but the eye. So uh, when I look at this, I'm seeing that um, Jesus is explaining into this text that the light of the body is, con is the condition of the eye. In a sense, Jesus is drawing a parallel through a metaphor of the eye. The light, like the eye notifies the body and the brain that light is available for the mind to perceive and act, a mind of God's way uh, should do the same. This metaphor and usage draws the conclusion that the entry point uh, to divine light is the condition of the mind. Isaiah 26 and 3 and 4 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And that helps me to understand that I don't have to run from situations and conditions because, because when I am in situations and conditions, I am the peace in the midst of that situation and the condition because I carry peace everywhere I go. It doesn't matter how bad you are going on in a room. When I get there, I bring peace with me because my mind is stayed on him. This is literally telling me that darkness in life is a result of darkness in my thinking. In a sense, as long as my thinking is stinking, my life stinks with it. But the moment I decide to think the way God wants me to think, my life starts to shift. If I want to get the light of God in me, it has to start with my heart. No wonder God says that the authority to what he has given me is a result of what we think. He says that salvation is based on this. If thou should confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, in a sense, I cannot be saved until I let light get into my heart. And so peace of mind is based on biblical thinking. Salvation is based on biblical thinking. With peace of mind, it says whatsoever thing is good, honest, virtuous. Think on these things. Now, I want to question each and every one of you who are here today. What were you thinking on during the storm? What were you thinking on after the storm? What do you think on on a daily basis? Because whatever you think, 
is what you're going to get. And it is not that I can create things that are not as though they were. It is that I can agree with what God has created and it will manifest in my life because the power of goodness and mercy is based on my believing that it's following me all the days of my life. When Jesus is in you, you become a light through the truth, his truth. There is something special about getting light when you've been in darkness. In this hurricane, uh, it induced, this hurricane induced darkness. Uh, in this hurricane, whenever I had gone, I had gone five days without light, and some of you are still without light. But the moment my light was restored, ooh, well, I felt power, wonder-working power. When the light was restored, the atmosphere changed because I had power to the air condition. When my light was restored, it was hot on the outside, but cool on the inside. When my light was restored, I slept a little better. Even though I turned the lights out, I slept better because I knew I had access to light. This hurricane, it, it, it helped us to learn how to rejoice in the light. It helped us to learn how to testify about the light. It helped me to learn how to put away the things that I needed in darkness because I was now in the light. Y'all ain't seeing this thing. When I learn that God has made a way out of no way, I got to testify about that thing. Okay, y'all, let me tell you what happened. I was here serving God when the lights were out. I heard that somebody else's light came on. So I said, Lord, let that overflow fall into my house. So by faith, I got in my car. By faith, I backed out of my parking spot. By faith, I drove down the highway. By faith, I pulled into my yard. I got out my car, unlocked the door, and I clicked on the lights, and the light said, here I is. And I stood there for about 20 seconds, and I had to give God praise. Now, you ain't been where I've been. You have not experienced what I experienced. I had some hot nights in that house, but when the lights came on, I had to shout a little bit. Now, you didn't see my shout, but it wasn't for you anyway. I shouted to the glory of God because the light was now on. But watch this. When you come out of the darkness that you're in right now, that depression, that, that, that suppression, that, that, that place of brokenness, when you come out of that place, you'll find a joy that will blow your mind. There are some people that are mad all the time because Satan has oppressed them with darkness. All it takes is just a little bit. I'm getting ahead of myself. I can see the light. The second thing is you, your eye must be centered on the light of Christ. Your eye must be centered on Christ as light. Your eye must be centered on the light of Christ. Matthew 6, 22, part, a, part B says, If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with light. This has to be one single, there has to be one single truth in your life. Jesus is that only single truth. John 14 and 6 says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Since Jesus is the truth and he is the word, then the word is the truth. John 1, 1 and then John 1, 14, it says, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14 says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, full of grace and full of truth. I have to center my heart on the word of God in spite of what's going on in my life. When everything is falling apart, I have to center my mind on the word of God. And the reason many of us who are believers are struggling even right now as you sit before me, because the moment you receive a word, you walk out and it gets choked out by life. And the moment your word gets choked out by life, 
you get what you focus on. Since you're focused on the trouble of life, you are now choking out the seed of God, and that's why you can't accomplish what God has for you. Y'all sit down, you're rocking the boat. So what you got to learn to do is put your eye on God no matter what's going on in your life. Your bills are due, but my God will supply all my need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Someone pass away in your life. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You're sick in your body. By his stripes, I am healed. It doesn't matter what the world says. You got to let the world say what God has said for you. And yes, you're going to look crazy. Yes, you're going to look like a fool. But we are a peculiar people. We are an, uh, an undignified praise group of folk. We are royal priests, so we don't look like everybody else. We don't respond like everybody else. Because God has brought us out of the ignorance into the marvelous knowledge that he has for us. You got to keep your eye on the word. Now, y'all don't play golf, but I do. Here's what I've learned. If you don't practice golf, you're going to mess it up. Because it requires so many things. I'm going to see if I can go out and show you. This is probably where I'm going to have to end because y'all like to get out on time. When you stand, the ball is right there. When you stand to swing the club at the ball, the rule of thumb is you have to keep your eye on the ball. Now keep in mind, your body is going to turn to the back and your body is going to swing to the front. Before you take your eye off the ball, the ball has to be gone from its place, uh -huh. and you can turn once the ball is released. If you don't do that, uh -huh. the position that is required to make good contact with the ball is going to be adjusted. So if I was to anticipate the swing of my club and lift up to see where the ball is going before I make contact with it, I am too far from the ground to make contact. And the same is true in the word, that if you live your life trying to look at the world and not at the word. If you live your life trying to deal with problems by looking at the problem and not the word, your eye will cause you to stand further from the word and closer to your problem. Come here, church. Some of y'all are going through things right now that God has delivered you from, and the only reason you're struggling is because you changed your line of sight. As long as your eye is on the Word of God, you will make contact with the blessings of God. I'm preaching better than three of you are responding. The third thing is recognize the presence of darkness in the heart. Recognizing the presence of darkness in the heart smothers the light. If you don't recognize that there's presence of darkness, your light will be smothered. Matthew 6, 23 says, But if thine eye, thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? It means that darkness has taken power over even the very power that you have. And that is the issue with the church today. Many of us have power, but we've released a word from Satan that chokes out and smothers the power that is in us. In a sense, we give more power to darkness than we do to the light. Because at the end of the day, what really manifests in our life is what we focus on. If light and darkness is in our mind, and we turn to darkness, even though the light is present, it has no power. But if we were to trust in the Lord with all of our heart, if we were to lean not to our own understanding, but in all of our ways acknowledge God, we would learn that there's a plan that God has for us in the midst of our darkness. There's a few of you that are here. And you're probably saying under your breath, well, that doesn't relate to me. Yeah, if you got some chaos going on in your life, you're stressing in your life, it's because what you've done is turn from the light to the darkness in you. 
the misery that we experience is based on us turning from the word of God to the darkness and the word of God is of such it's it's this way we have to speak the word of God homologially which means that I've got to not only speak it, but I've got to become one with it in order for it to manifest in my life. I've got to, be, I've got to believe the word so much that I speak it even though I don't see it. And I speak it not as if it's going to happen to me, but I speak it as if it is me. When I learn to speak the word of God that way, all the darkness that is in me can no longer overtake me. I can move from the darkness into the light. And there are many of you who are gifted to do great things in God, but you're holding on to the darkness. You don't know that we've been programmed over time to just embrace the darkness. Is there anybody here that wants to just walk in the light? If you want to walk in the light, I want you to stand to your feet. And I want you to say, Lord, smother the darkness in my heart. The strategy of Satan. I think I got to explain what that means. Here it is. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, it was a trick from the enemy that convinced them that they needed something that they did not need. Satan said to Eve, he said, If you eat of this fruit, did God say you will die? He said, yeah, the very day we eat, we will surely die. And he said to her, well, you won't really die. But what will happen is you'll be like me and God. You'll know the difference between good and evil. Now, that was not a whole lie. A half lie is a whole lie. And she gave away her inheritance so that she could have a moment of pleasure to embrace a desire that she didn't need to have. This is the same way Satan tricks us right now. He will tell you you need something that you don't need. He will tell you that you need to go after something that you don't need to have in your life. How many of you have had a moment where you went after something only to discover that it wasn't as good as you thought it was? That's how Satan takes everything from you. And right now I believe God is going to release in this place the type of healing that's going to open your eyes. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to activate the power that is in you. And I want you to pray over yourself. I want you to pray over yourself right now. I want you to pray and ask God now to heal you from the program darkness of yesterday. Just go ahead and say those words. Lord, heal me from the patterns of darkness that's in me. I need you to say it. Come on and say it again. Lord, heal me from the patterns of darkness that's in me. Lord, wake up a desire to walk in the light. Go ahead and say that again. Lord, wake up a desire to walk in the light. The reason I think this is important to you and I'm stalling on communion is because some of you have purpose in your life that's been aborted because of darkness. But if God puts it in you, everything you need to get it done is already present. And the only thing that will keep you from accomplishing it is fear. I got to share this analogy as I get to the table. Go ahead and pull this up. We're going to serve it in a second. One day, I had to go to Atlanta to have a meeting with some pastors. We were going to meet at a place called Panera Bread. And while sitting in the car, the Lord said, look. And I looked up and saw three parking spots from me, what looked like a hundred dollar bill. Now, when I saw that, I thought about where I was and how the news advertised people getting shot in Atlanta all the time. You never, you go to Atlanta every morning, five people got shot over here, 12 people got shot over there. And the devil planted a seed with God's blessing. The hundred dollar bill, three parking spots away from me. I'm looking at this money and the devil said, that's a trap. That's a trap. 
So I sat there and stared at the money to see if somebody would pull away so that I can assess whether the trap was there or the blessing was there. About 15 minutes later, yeah, I did it for 15 minutes, y'all. 15 minutes later, someone else walked by and looked down and said, oh, they grabbed that hundred dollar bill and walked straight into Panero Bread. And then the Lord said, this was an example of how my people live their lives. I put blessings in front of them and they let fear keep them from those blessings, just like you did. And the truth is that whenever you don't embrace what God puts in front of you, he will always send somebody else who will appreciate that blessing. And now some of us are walking in darkness because of fear, but I'm telling you right now, I declare in the name of Jesus that those chains are broken off of you right now. And I cast the spirit of fear out of every last one of you. We denounce it now in the name of Jesus. You will not walk in fear. You will not walk in darkness, but you will walk in the marvelous light. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you bless this bread and wine as we partake. Uh, we ask that you forgive us for not being holy and righteous in this moment. Lord, present us before you as righteous because of your son, Jesus. And as we celebrate, we will celebrate worthy in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are here today and you are a baptized believer, you are welcome to celebrate in the Lord's Supper. We'll celebrate the Lord's Supper the same way we did our offering. As the ushers uh, direct you from the rear, come to the front, receive it, and we'll celebrate together. If we've omitted on anyone, raise your hand and we'll come and serve you now. If we've omitted anyone, raise your hand and we'll come serve you now. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. Body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. On the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he went into the upper room, and when they sat at supper, he took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body which is given for you, and they all ate together. In the same manner, he lifted the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take, drink. This is the New Testament in my blood. As often as you eat and drink, you do show forth my suffering until I come again. And they all drank together. After eating and drinking, they left the upper room.
and went into a mount of olives singing praises to God. I want to do two things. I want to give those of you an opportunity who feel like you've been drugged by darkness. Some of the most holy people have allowed darkness to keep them hostage. If things have been going on in your life and you've been feeling heavy, that's what darkness feels like. And I recommend that you connect with the elders in prayer. The Bible says in prayer, one can chase a thousand, but two can chase ten thousand. Some of you have been praying, but you haven't seen any power. That's because you've been praying by yourself. The only place God has released the power to bind and loose is in the church. And this is why Satan wants to keep people from the church. Well, yeah, we know we got a lot of imperfect people, but it's enough, it, it still is the perfect place for one more imperfect person. And all of us are imperfect. And so I want to give you an opportunity to come to the altar and connect with the elders in prayer in order to overcome whatever pressures you've had in your life. And you just walk down the aisle. There's no form or fashion to it. We're going to do benediction while the people are coming to the altar to pray. Just walk on up. Just walk on up. If you're going through, walk on up. Don't be embarrassed about it. I would rather people talk about me and I get delivered than to hold on to my brokenness and never see my deliverance. So just walk on up. Just walk on up. If you're going through, you feel pressure. You feel sick in the body, troubled. Just walk on up and get God's deliverance by connecting in prayer. Your prayer with the elder's prayer can bring God's deliverance. With that said, if you also want to connect with this ministry, just go to the altar, let the elders know, and they will start you on that journey. God is doing something right now. Just because folk are not laying on the floor don't mean God is not doing supernatural things in the atmosphere. I can feel the charge of God in the atmosphere. Let us go to the throne of grace. Father, I thank you for all that you've done today. I thank you for giving us the power to deal with even this hurricane. Now, Father, I ask that you protect the word that we receive today so that as we leave this place, it will be activated in our lives. And Father, as we leave this place, but never your presence, we're asking for a continuous flow of your grace and a manifestation of the power of your sweet holy communion. Lord, let it rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace, and may the peace of God be with you.